this for the weekend. transformation is about so much more than just building digital products. It's about helping the organisation to be fit for the digital age. And that's about designing processes and services, whether internal or external, so that they're set up to meet the changing expectations, uh, whether that's beneficiaries, supporters, staff or volunteers. And that goes way beyond just the digital team. That involves looking at redesigning our processes. It goes towards working with chief people officer around the culture, the skills that we need, the chief finance officer around new processes for governance and budgeting. So it's really about rethinking how we become a more agile and digital organization end to end. Accenture Development Partnerships helps international development sector organizations harness the power of market-led innovation and digital technologies. Our partnership with the Center for the Digital Nonprofit has allowed us to collaborate on three design deliver programs with Compassion International, MedAir, SOS Children's Villages, and the Norwegian Refugee Council to create global impact at scale. The most valuable service from the Center for SOS in 2019 was certainly the Dream Workshop. Together with 13 program colleagues from six different countries and two former SOS program participants, we took a look into SOS digital future and created four ideas. During the next months, we will be creating prototypes for some of these ideas and we will be testing them in East Africa amongst others. And we are looking forward to sharing and discussing our ideas with you at the summit in Puerto Rico. See you there! When thinking about the CDN, I must go back at the start of our digital transformation journey. In particular, at taking the DNA, or the Digital Non-Profitability Assessment. The results of that gave us a starting point to have the necessary conversations inside the organization on where we were and where we wanted to go. More importantly, it showed us against our peers and against the sector benchmark. That was a very powerful moment to get the people in the room and start having those difficult conversations. So if you were like us a few years ago, start with the DNA and see where you are and how you wanna start your journey to where you wanna get. Through the Dream Design Deliver process and the collaboration with Microsoft, Accenture, and Fiora Design, we have envisioned a future state for our legal aid program. Um, we've really looked at what it will be like when NRC enters the digital quadrant of the digital needs assessment, and what that will mean both for our staff and for our beneficiaries as they interact in the digital sphere. Radical collaboration is at the core of the CDM, and we're proud of that. We're really excited to be a part of this work. The more that we learn from you all through the digital non-profitability and skills assessments and the idea sessions, the more we can map together through our joint pro bono teams and joint solution teams, learning or technology pathways that do in fact enable you to fulfill your missions. Let's do this work together. Please be a part of the CDM. Prohair over the last 30 years has empowered millions of women throughout Latin America. Today, we see digital transformation as a very important catalyst for exponential growth and impact. Through Lab Hope's Idea Accelerator, we are participating in an exciting process of ideation and coming up with high impact solutions powered by technology and strategic partnerships. As founding members of the Center, we're able to collaborate on solution building for some of the sector's most pressing tech challenges. While a part of this partnership involves co-creating education, this step would not be possible without the interactions we have at the regional chapter meetings. Here is where we establish meaningful relationships, learn from each other, and ideate on how we can build a better future for NGOs together. Beyond joint projects and tech innovation, we've also made lifelong friends. The work we do with nonprofits is more meaningful to us. It gives everyone a good feeling about what we're doing when we're helping these organizations to accomplish their missions. My advice to NetHope members who are considering going through this digital transformation process is not to be discouraged by the potential cost of the overall project. The important thing is to get started. Engage with a partner in the first phase. At least that will give you a blueprint for what it is you're looking to do over the long term. The DREAM program 
It gave us an opportunity to explore a real business challenge that Mercy Corps is facing globally tied to our grant administration and management processes and give us a chance to really bring together our best minds and creative ideas to come up with some inspirational potential solutions behind this. It was a great opportunity for us to work on this challenge together, and frankly, I am really excited to see where we're gonna take this. Hello, NetHope attendees. We're excited to be with you at this outstanding global summit this week. Digital transformation is often perceived as a back office function to get efficiency. However, the expectations of your supporters are undergoing a radical shift. People don't just prefer, they expect a Facebook-like experience. Simple, intuitive, and personalized. To really understand the best ways to engage your supporters, you need to consolidate your data on them. This allows you to effectively know how and when to communicate with them. We're especially excited and proud to be working with NetHope and the Center for the Digital Nonprofit to help you on this journey. Thank you, we look forward to seeing more of you this week. My experience with the Center for the Digital Nonprofit, yeah, it brings us together and, and uh, technology partners that are great and very dedicated to what we're trying to do collectively. But it's really about the collaboration amongst the members that, to me, is invaluable. Okta has always been about connecting people and technology. And with Okta for Good, we say that we're on a mission to strengthen the connections between people, technology, and community. I can't think of a better partner to help us bring that mission to life than NetHope. Oxfam, NRC, Plan International, Direct Relief, and many, many more. Keep pushing, keep telling us what you need, and keep motivating us to do even more together. We cannot wait to see where we all go from here. Thank you, NetHope members, for your partnership. We appreciate all you do to change the world through technology. Thank you, NetHope, for creating the digital skills framework to help nonprofits identify the tools they need to be successful. Thank you, NetHope, for backing standards across platforms that make the nonprofit common data model possible. For encouraging innovation and interoperability across platforms. For working with us to spearhead nonprofit digital transformation. For being great partners on research, thought leadership, and storytelling. Thank you, thank you, thank you, NetHope, and all of the members for advancing the nonprofit sector. Thank you, NetHope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Good. Great. 
So well, I need the clicker. You need a clicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another transformation. <laughs> you see our fingers. Look at that. Look, did you see that transformation right there? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, to start off with, the uh, assessment tools that we've, uh, we've created, uh, we have the digital nonprofit abilities assessment and the DNS assessment. But in general, uh, these are uh, tools to uh, allow you to uh, um, to uh, assess yourself and uh, identify gaps in, in, in the journey uh, ahead. So making sure that you're fit, right? right. So uh, this year we really spent a lot of time uh, in automating the DNA assessment. And uh, he's a <coughs> programmer right over here. Here's the designer over here, whatever. This is the team, folks. So that's it. Um, but we, uh, at this point, the DNA assessment is fully automated. Uh, it is, uh, you go, you take the, uh, the answer to the questions, uh, you will automatically and uh, more or less immediately receive the results in an email. You'll also get pointers to charts and graphs to, that give you uh, some deeper observations. So, uh, what do you think? Should we ask everybody to either take or retake the, the DNA yeah, assessment? I, think, I mean, you heard it from Pietro, right? Um, that's a pretty good, good step to take, right? Take the DNA, spend about 20 minutes or so taking it out, look at the solution center and, and find out where you stack up against the sector. There's another set of tools that allows you to identify gaps or set priorities, and that's uh, our digital skills workshops. And those are defined or uh, designed to identify a set of skills that are super important in your organization, and then also identify if those skills are actually present in your organization as an outcome of each of those workshops. You'll get a priority list and saying, you know, this particular area, maybe HR, is lacking here, but it's really <laughs> important to us, so we need to, need, need, uh, need to focus on, on those areas. So uh, that those, we have uh, uh, several uh, uh, of these workshops in, in place. Uh, we have them for digital responsibility, for entrepreneurship, uh, for data, and Tomorrow, you're going to get the chance to uh, go through the technical literacy workshop that uh, Leanne is putting together. Alrighty. So, in all those assessments, we're really well prepared. And, uh, and, and now I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, do you mind pressing the next slide, please? Uh, I, yeah. It's right there. So, uh, let's talk about how we advance. And advancing in digital transformation is a hard, hard task. Um, we do that through IDEA. And uh, we do that through the working groups, and we also do that through the digital skills framework. But also, we have uh, partnered with MyProtease. When it gets really difficult, when the change becomes the change, MyProtease and John Roberts is uh, the, the team to go to. But while I am very happy to spend the next hour with you talking about digital transformation, I think it's a lot better to spend 10 minutes with the people who have lived it. So, Adam, British Red Cross, right? You talk a lot about uh, new ways of working and others. So can you, like, quickly, about three minutes, share with us about what did British Red Cross want to do and how you went about those new ways of working? Yeah, thanks, Joe. So, get that the one. That's fine. So, um, there's 90,000 uh, refugees and asylum seekers in the UK, and it's an incredibly complex system to navigate. Even if you can get the access to the services you need, it might not be in the language that you need, and um, lots of different actors in that space. So the Dream Session allowed us to really take that step back and look at the solution end to end and understand it from a beneficiary point of view and see where those gaps were and where we could add the most value. Um, it was really exciting for us because it's a catalyst for the new ways of working across the organization. So it allowed us to co-create with beneficiaries so at the Red Cross, we have 100 um, refugees and asylum seekers with lived experience who we draw on for policy and advocacy work. But this was an opportunity to actually bring them into the creation of an end-to-end -end digital experience and co-create them. So that was a really good way to demonstrate it. Um, using design thinking that we're embedding in the organization and also breaking down those false divides between sectors. So having Neco, Avanard, Microsoft in the room to bring different perspectives. So it's, it really helped us move beyond building a digital product like an app or a website to thinking about it end to end. But as you saw in the video, the bit for us that's really exciting now to work with NetHope and, and corporates on is how do you build that 
enabling environments. So it's fine to design more system end to end, but you don't want that to be a one off experience. You want that to become the new norm that's constantly evolving. So um, that requires us to work with the CFO to look at how you fund these projects, work with the chief people officer to look at what skills we need, what new governance mechanisms do we need, what incentives, what skills. So it's been a really good catalyst, but I think there's lots of opportunities for us to also to look at that broader digital journey that is happening across sectors and um, recognize the similarities and lessons to be shared. Great, thanks, Anne. And then, um, so Mike, uh, Mike, Compassion International is further ahead than anyone else in that journey of digital transformation. Um, you have some story to tell us about, you know, you've been there, you're, you're coming back and, uh, and you want to share with those who are interested, you know, what's ahead. So why don't you share that with us? So about a two and a half year journey. Can I have three minutes? Yes. <laughs> and I, I know you're going on this. <laughs> So for, the, for those of you that don't know what we're uh, we're a faith-based organization, the Policy and Child Development. It takes the form, if you will, of a child sponsorship organization. So with that, I think you kind of get the, get the idea. Um, Sizing-wise, 2 million children, 1.3 million uh, supporters. We always operate through a local church. Um, we have 7,500 churches. <laughs> 7,500 7, churches. Uh, 25 countries, uh, and we had about one church a day. Um, revenue last year was about uh, $890 million, um, and that's almost all for individual supporters like, like you and I. So, um, let me talk real briefly about what the challenge was, what we dreamed about, what the solution was, and then really quickly the journey along the way. So the challenge is really, really simple. So we're blessed to, to serve 2 million people, but there are 400 million children living in poverty. So the dream subject is how do we reach as many children as possible and release them from poverty. So about two years ago, we had a first dream session from Metro, Microsoft, and Accenture. This is where I need my notes. We sequestered 15 people for three days. Only three of those people were uh, compassion IT folks. The rest was business partners. We developed 179 ideas. We had five guest speakers. We had four organizations involved. We had five defining principles, 21 concepts, five joint maps, four pitches. And the reason I go through all that is there's no way Compassion could have done that on our own. That's where we needed Accenture, that's where we needed Microsoft, that's where we needed Echo, that were incredibly in their depth. What we came up on with all of that is that the, the pitch we landed on was basically an open platform that would connect those who have a need with those who have the capability to give. So that could be the mom of the child uh, that's a current compassion child getting a service from an NGO that's in this room that's paid for by a compassion sponsor. It could be a child in Kenya that's receiving services from a social entrepreneur in Rwanda. It could be a pastor in San Francisco that's having cultural issues with their congregation and wants help from a pastor in Singapore. So an open platform, right? So all kinds of interactions that can occur on that. Where we are today, again, two years later, is a work on the Microsoft AI team to put together the core of that solution, which is a recommender engine. We fed 400,000 transactions into that engine with 110,000 sponsors. Um, it's over an eight year period. We're in the process of bringing additional data into that platform. And then in the December timeframe, we think we'll have an engine that is demoable enough for us to move that forward. Spring timeframe, we'll start doing a pilot with at least one other. That's the short version. Along the way, a couple quick things. So we, we did this uh, little Salesforce deployment. There was an enterprise level deployment that reached all 7,500 churches over 12 languages, a huge effort. That was finished off, that was stabilized during that process. We brought in an SVP of innovations. So we had a little bit of organization change that came through. We had this thing called GDPR that came up. We had a new CFO, we have a new general counsel, we have a new SVP of program. Thanks. The things that are coming on. The point is, dream big. Two, two takeaways. Dream big because there's, and, and make it really, really simple to understand because there's going to be a lot of change. There's going to be a lot of priorities come in. And number two, it's not for the faint of heart. Don't try it alone. Get partners. Thanks, Mike. And um, and so, uh, Patty, uh, why don't you share with us the internal journey of the Carter Center and what it's been? Sure, so of the three of us up here, we're the earliest in our, our journey. We did um, our 
dream sessions last spring, but we're still recovering from that. Um, <laughs> and um, we're trying to figure out what design means to us. And we really, um, we focus internally because we, we feel firmly believe that if we can do better internally, we can um, have 10x transformation, that we can give more time and energy to our beneficiaries. Uh, we've grown a lot over the years, both uh, through acquisition and, um, and just growing, and we've not changed anything in 30 years. So nothing talks to each other, um, nothing is integrated, nothing, nobody works together really uh, in the back office. So we're focusing on financials. It seems like that would be really easy because I did my first GL implementation 30-something years ago. But um, it's not. It's in an organization like ours, you know, the trail of money is like um, an organ transplant. Because everything is like, there's little threads that go into every process for every department everywhere. And we're very grateful to Microsoft and AKA and NetHome. The dream session was amazing. We had about 25 people for two days. Um, you guys saw some pictures with the AKA video. Uh, the best thing that came out of it was it was unanimous across the whole organization on what we needed to do. The hard work starts now, and doing it is going to be very expensive in time. It's going to be very expensive in money. It's going to take a lot of political capital from several of us to, to kind of push it through. But we're really excited about doing that. Um, yeah. What are going to pay off? What, what about digital skills? How did that pay out? So it's not playing out yet, it's fixing to, because we're, we're looking at having you know, one integrated <coughs> system globally across you know, about 20 countries, and not everyone in our offices is like comfortable with, with the technology. So I've been working a lot with Leanne on the digital skills framework and trying to figure out how we're going to implement that to, to make you know, the changes we're going to make. So uh, thank you very much, panelists. So I encourage you to talk with them <laughs> at the break and others. We heard from Adam about new ways of working. We heard about Mike, what it takes to be further ahead and the internal journey from Patty. Thank you very much. Let's listen next to Ian Gillow who's going to talk with us about vision skills. Well, there's been a lot of work done in the Center for the Digital Nonprofit and it gave us a good set of information and also pointed out some gaps in that transformation journey. One of the gaps was around people and people skills. Not surprising, it didn't surprise me, I'm sure it doesn't surprise any of you. In fact, I'd venture to say that um, there are always going to be gaps in people's skills because things change in this area all the time. So we then set up upon uh, the question, what skills? Because that's kind of a broad category, you know? So what are those skills? And that um, set, a set of research evaluating disruptive technologies, existing frameworks, talking to experts, reading lots of research papers that culminated in the creation of the digital skills framework. And this framework organized the skills that we were interested in evaluating. And then we looked at that framework and we said, well, where are we relative to the skills as a sector, but also in our membership? So we delivered a digital nonprofit skills assessment and got over 500 responses. That's 18,000 pieces of data. But I'll tell you, even after the first 50 responses, the trends, the patterns, the gaps that we saw really didn't change. 50, 100, 500, those gaps remained the same. So we felt like we had a really good set of information. We then turned to the experts, our members. And they spent months with me, I'm sorry for you, but they spent months with me talking about digital skills, their experiences in their own organizations, what their successes were, what the best practices were, but also the challenges and the obstacles and the things that really didn't work. And I want to thank them for their participation and their patience in that because your voice was heard and it mattered a lot. So we took that information and we created workshops. Frederick mentioned the workshops. And we dove deep to figure out well, where are those priorities um, within those areas. And where do we start when we look at um, addressing digital skills in those gaps? And we started with technical literacy. Because come to find out when you've got an obstacle in the road, no matter how fast you want to go, you kind of have to address that before you can move forward. And technical literacy is the foundation for the entire digital skills framework. It recognizes that every person in the organization has to have some level of technical proficiency. 
And they need to do that because if you want to be a digitally enabled organization, you can't have people checking out of that process. So then we turned to a different set of experts. And we partnered with Humentum, Pluralsight, and TechSoup because of the great content that they build and because they put customers at the center of their design and decision process. We also partnered with Microsoft because of their investment in digital skills and because um, they have that Microsoft community training platform which is freely available for everybody to use. And we've spent the last four months together really looking at and pulling those threads of technical literacy to figure out how we map content that helps you get where you need to go in a really focused way. Because there's a lot of content out there. We have an abundance of content, right? That's not the problem. It's like, how do you really tailor it so that you're getting the skills that you need when you need them? So Lauren talked yesterday about the launch of the technical literacy learning track. And together with these partners, we have, we have curated a set of content that supports technical literacy, is available now for you on the Solutions Center and it addresses the skills that we heard from you as members and that map to the technical literacy learning track. And there's really three paths for you on there. The first is a set of curated content that is contextual in nature. It gives you information about the skills themselves. It also gives you some problem solving um, content that you can use, say you want to learn how to get started with Salesforce, you can go up there and do that you um, want to learn how to uh, choose the right technology, there's a lot of great content on that. Um, and that's curated in one of the paths. And TechSoup has curated a set of content um, that is built by nonprofit professionals for nonprofit in the language of nonprofits. And it's a really great set of content. It also includes the Microsoft Digital Skills Center that they released last month uh, together with Microsoft. And then the third set of content is from Pluralsight. And Pluralsight has a pretty broad library of very deep technical content that looks sort of end-to-end -end at, at skill development. And they have really focused that and curated that down to about 70 courses that support te technical literacy. And that also is available for you. So I'm super excited about it. And I hope you go up there, check it out, explore, give us feedback. We are just getting started here. Um, and I think you're going to find it an exciting start. But I'd love for you to hear about the partners themselves, so let's hear from them. We're excited to be engaging with NetHope and the Center for the Digital Nonprofit. We're happy because this is an opportunity for us to increase our collective knowledge about the capacities in the nonprofit sector and the capacities that need to be built. To that end, we're excited that we can contribute courses from the Digital Skills Center into the overall framework so that organizations can not just have the opportunity to learn what they have to learn, but, but they can take the courses that increase the capacity of their employees to be able to better manage and use the technology that they implement. And we're excited to see what happens next. Linton is a global membership association that provides training, convening, and support. Enabling organizations to achieve operational excellence is at the heart of Humentum's work. In an effort to prepare nonprofits for what will be needed to be operationally excellent in the world of digital skills, Humanitar partnered with Network Microsoft, Pluralsight One, and TechSoup to allow the digital skills framework for technical needs. This framework has been developed to help our members to transform their operations and employees to be more prepared and ready for being an effective organization in a digital age. By building the skills of your staff through technical literacy, digital responsibility, or adaptive collaboration, Humentum hopes to prepare you for the digital future and provide the skills you need to succeed and to make a greater impact for you. Pluralsight One is committed to supporting NetHome with a sector-wide solution that powers the digital transformation journey. We have to ensure that all nonprofits have access to the tech skills they need to transform their organizations, accelerate their impact, and equip the communities they support with the skills needed for the future of work. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leanne, and also thank you very much to the content partners for the uh, technical uh, literacy learning track. I think you're going to say it over there. Okay, well, make it. We're trans transforming all the time. Uh, so uh, let's. Uh, about that.
to be having a successful idea journey. So look forward to us trying to get more sponsors for your idea journeys. And that's it for idea. What about skills? Oh my goodness. Well, you're getting me excited about the idea journeys. <laughs> So there are a lot of things happening in skills, and there's always work to do. Um, Frederick mentioned the workshops, and I definitely want to fill out different workshops around skills. And just so that you know, those workshops are self-serve. They're posted on the solution site. You're welcome to take them down, use them in your own organization. And the one thing that um, I think is, there's lots of great things about it, but one thing that I think is super important is it's really hard to figure out where to start. So, you know, you have this... Um, digital skills that you, you want to implement in your organization. But again, it's still broad, even with the framework. And the workshops really help you focus because at the end of it, you come out with your number one priority by role and by skill. And so I encourage you to go up and look at the workshops and there's gonna be more coming there. Second, we've delivered one technical literacy learning track and I think that's great. Uh, but the partners that I'm working with we are all committed to filling out the rest of the learning track. We have another five to go, and so we're gonna continue working on that. And then third, we have content um, that was contributed by Tech Impact. They've, uh, they've contributed about 10 or 12 courses, I think. Um, that's up there, a lot of great, very quality content from them. Um, Okta has sent in some content that's going to be posted up on the Solution Center as well. Oracle wants to contribute, Salesforce wants to contribute, so we're gonna broaden the partner contributions and make it a real community based on the content or the uh, technology that you use and, and what you tell, tell us that you need. So um, that's what's in the future of digital skills, and I, I think we're probably just scratching the surface, but I'm excited about the road ahead. It's uh, great to uh, hear the, the expansion of the partnerships and yeah. people uh, contributing. Uh, the, the, the content shouldn't be limited to what our partners uh, contribute, but if you have good content that you're using inside of your organization, we want to know about that as well. So in good uh, NetHope tradition, we, we share that with everybody else as well. And of course, scale, in order to scale, we have to collaborate, and we would never scale NetHope the way it is here at the summit without the awesome collaboration that we have between the members, between the vendors, and others. So, Next slide. Uh, I, I want to just talk one second about the workshops. Uh, they are, uh, we've actually run a few of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I think JL and I did one in the European chapter in, uh, in February, and, uh, uh, and I think Catherine and I did another one in the European chapter meeting in June. And so if I can do them, you can do them. So we'll look for them <laughs> and, 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 and use them in your organization. They're super insightful. You do them once and you say, wow, I might do that with a bunch of different groups in my organization because it really highlights the areas we need to focus on in terms of uh, new capacity building with the uh, digital skills in the organization. So good luck with that. And when you've done them, report back to us how, how you do and, and, and how we can improve that uh, information. So uh, with that, we, what we want to do, of course, we want to thank our founding partners, uh, Avanal, Blackboard, Box, Okta, Microsoft, and uh, Oracle, uh, NetSuite, and Social Impact. Uh, without them, we could not do this work. It's uh, uh, been incredible to have, uh, not only, of course, their financial support, but also their uh, guidance in, ter in terms of how we, uh, we, we, we conduct our business. Uh, this is what they do. They go out and provide uh, help to their, their customers for, for the digital transformation. So having them on our back is absolutely incredible. We also want to uh, thank our consulting partners that have been instrumental in D3 or the idea journey execution. So uh, Accenture, uh, AKA, Avanade, Revel, and Woodfleet. Uh, the, 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 the talent and execution and the help we've been uh, getting from them has been absolutely fantastic. And in the video in this early, earlier, you heard the enthusiasm from the members in terms of what they got out of these, uh, uh, these idea workshops. Uh, of the idea, uh, the imagined workshops. The, um, uh, lost my thread, so, the, uh, but, but what, so please go up and take a look at the dream books that have been posted on the Meadow Solutions Center. Those, that's the output of those imagined sessions. And it'll blow you away. It'll take you a while to get through all 15, because they, you know, they're pretty extensive, but you know, do one, two, two every weekend between now and the holidays, and you'll, 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 you'll get through it. But uh, it's, it's fantastic. And just imagine 
the dynamics and the, the thinking that went through in these Imagine sessions to, to produce those uh, those uh, in the dream books. So about it. Uh, you should also read the blogs. Uh, uh, JL is pretty good at writing up, you know, what was experienced in those idea sessions. So that's entertaining reading as well. So with that, one more thing. I mean, one more thing. Uh, yeah, I think there is one more thing. Just one thing. Yeah, and we are so thrilled. We are absolutely so thrilled to announce that we are welcoming another founding partner to the, uh, the uh, Central Digital Nonprofit. And we'd like the, the salesforce.org guys to stand hey. up. All again, the salesforce.org to stand up.
And SMART is now being adopted at 800 sites globally. It's used to support rangers in the field, to monitor what they're doing, to optimize the patrol routes they're going on, to make sure rangers deter poachers, capture poachers, and address human wildlife conflict. It was started by eight organizations coming together. As I said, we're now at 800 sites. The biggest NGO in the world in terms of their field footprint is at under 200 sites. We're four times bigger than the biggest global NGO, and we're growing. We have 16 governments who have nationally adopted our solution, written it in to regulations that it must be used. And so we can do transformation at a far bigger scale than our own organizations. And we can do transformation that is about addressing the issues of our day, taking those head on, and not solving them. IT is not going to solve them, technology is not going to solve them, but pushing the needle, driving efficiencies. A second example is something called PAUSE. This actually fits on the back of SMART, and it's about using AI to optimize where, where patrols go in a protected area. So if you want to decide where a patrol goes, you need to think about what is the geography of the protected area? What are the ingress, the entry routes, the rivers, the roads? Where do the communities live? Where is the wildlife? And what has been the history of seeing poaching or other events? And that's a complex problem. And that's nothing we have the resources on our own to solve. But through help from Microsoft and Harvard University, we've built a solution called PAUSE that we're integrating into our platform. And we've built a separate coalition around that. And what's exciting there is not only have we got something that we would never be able to afford on our own, but we've, we've begun to understand that in building coalitions and working with academia, you need to think about the different incentives you have and academia have. Academia want to create papers. They're not interested in scalable, impactful solutions. But they deliver brilliant ideas. And so through working together with them, we've brought the academia into our coalitions. And we have lots of examples where we have research groups working on our coalitions. Here's a third area, wildlife insights. So, one of the best ways to monitor wildlife around the world is use camera traps. Put out camera traps in a huge array of protected air and capture images. There are two challenges. The, the one that's most obvious about camera traps is how do you identify which animal is in a camera trap? The actually most important challenge is not to identify which animal, but whether an animal is there, whether it's blank or not. Because all around the world, conservation organizations are spending thousands and thousands of hours looking through photos, pulling out the blanks, but they must get the ones with the, image, the animals in. Even if, even if it's a foot of a tiger in the right bottom corner, in the dark, they must capture it, because it's only then that their population assessments will be rigorous. Again, we have the expertise to create the tool, the front-end tool, we had the knowledge, we had the, the, the huge volume of data, set, data sets, which was clearly labeled for the AI. We didn't have the resources or capabilities to deliver on that. So again, we built a coalition of eight organizations, including both conservation organizations, but also organizations like Smithsonian. But bringing Google in, who committed to deliver just one component, but a most critical component, we delivered a solution that now is deployed across 20 countries, used by 15 different agencies, again, delivering a solution at scale and not addressing our organizational efficiencies, addressing a challenge of our community. Another example here was Wild, Wild Labs. Wild Labs is a, a community across the conservation sector bringing academia, technology partners, and the conservation community together. Again, this was a tool that was built across multiple agencies that delivered on a very specific need and has at itself begun spurring off other coalitions. And it works because it's a coalition of, of common interest. And you know, this, this actually image on the screen is one dialogue where people were trying to figure out a solution. And it shows how active that, that community was. The last example I want to talk to you about is, is Cobo for Conservation. So as I mentioned, a lot of our work in conservation is about people the communities around protected areas. Are those communities valuing 
the conservation act? Are they impacted negatively by human wildlife conflict? How do they feel the area is governed? So we came together as a, as a community, understanding that the research and evidence wasn't strong enough for the programs we needed to, to, to work on. But we knew there were solutions already out there that, that took us 80% of the way. So we identified Kobo Toolbox. Not sure if people know it, but Kobo Toolbox is like ODK or Survey123, a range of survey tools. But it, it covered 80% of what we need. 80%, that's, that's a great starting point. And what we have done now is we've built a, a, a coalition around that, not to, not to build from ground zero all the way up as a survey tool, but to focus on, on the aspects that, where, there, where there's, a, where there's a, a missing need. Building standard surveys, building best practice, building a bit of technology to allow us to integrate the, the, the data from the surveys into our own systems and provide canned analysis. But again, we've come together as a community and identified a common need and we've shared our investments. And so I pay 10, 10 cents on the dollar for this solution because everyone else is paying 10 cents on the dollar. And this brings us to where we are today in the conservation community. Digital transformation for most of us is not about transforming our organizations. It's about standing up and saying, what are the big challenges facing our industry? Let us stand up together and solve these together. It's about hybrid product development. It's about understanding what is the role of, of the Microsoft, the Salesforce, the Googles, the Amazons out there. What is the role of academia? What is our role? How do, we, how do we come together and, and craft solutions and, and not expect someone to deliver them, but also not go off and just try and build them ourselves? It's about building shared roadmaps together. Cool. Thank you. Um, so just some brief reflections, and I'll, I've got one minute. So let's think about where digital transformation doesn't matter. It matters on raising revenue, and execute on our missions. Making our, our back office 10% faster, making people email 5% faster, great, but it's not what really matters. Pilotitis, this, this continually creating pilots. We joke about it and we laugh, it's an embarrassing secret. It's not an embarrassing secret, it's unethical. It's a disgrace and we need to own it. And it goes beyond that. I don't understand when, when we're in meetings like this, we hear about you know, partners creating solutions because they're rushed by donors and they end up creating a bot bot that is enforcing gender stereotypes. I don't understand where we have two or three partners working on solutions for case management in refugee response, and they're working independently of each other. I don't understand it. And even that is unethical. We have limited resources. We've got to bring those together and solve problems at scale. You know, there's, there's, of course, there's, there's opportunity cost with collaboration. It's not easy. Smart, the first example I gave, took two years of dialogue. We didn't, we didn't promise to deliver a solution within six months. We took two years to get it right, to build the business plan, to make sure it was sustainable, to fully understand the need and to bring everyone on board. But the benefits are overwhelming. And the bottom line is this can be done sector-wide. And NETO can be the community that leads that. So with that, I'd like to close. Again, my presentation was free from logos up until this point. This is a bit of a logo soup. But it's been a journey of not only all our partners, but so many supporters, and I want to acknowledge them. So with that, uh, thank you for your time today. So I, it's my mic, sorry. So I think there's five others joining us up on stage now. So of course, I, I started by saying that coalitions were the only way forward. Of course, they're not the only way forward, but it's, it's good to lead with a an opinion. Um, I'd like to welcome five great thought leaders up on stage, people who are living and breathing, breathing, breathing ICD for D in their organization. And so with that, I think I'd like to bring you all up on stage. Cool. Great. Okay, welcome. Cheers. Okay, good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, 
I'm John Zoltner. I'm the lead for ICT for D at Save the Children. I'm a Save the Children U.S. employee, but I work across the movement. Uh, and I'm here with uh, four other leads for ICT for D, uh, plus a CIO. And uh, we're here to talk about um, how we approach uh, what we call ICT for D. And probably even with this audience, I should explain uh, the term. ICT for D stands for Information and Communication Technologies for Development. And uh, it's basically, instead of working in enterprise IT, uh, architecting applications across the organization, uh, we sit with the people who design programs and, uh, and implement programs in order to help them figure out the best ways to integrate technology in their work, to make it more efficient or more scalable, uh, and in the end, more effective. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I want to recognize that at the last minute, we lost Sherry Sims from World Vision. Uh, so, we are not gender diverse at all. That was never the plan. Uh, but the show must go on. Uh, so, but we were very lucky to have Scott Mills take her place. Uh, Scott is CIO of World Vision International. And i um, happy to have you, Scott. Uh, then we have Ahmed Mihaimi uh, from SOS Children's Villages, uh, Alan Donald from Mercy Corps, and Steve Helen from CRS. Uh, and what we're going to do is, uh, uh, when I started at Save the Children uh, a little less than two years ago, I reached out to a lot of my peers to ask them uh, for some advice on how we should design our ICT for D team at SAVE. And I, I just had, I found a lot of openness, and uh, even though there are, there are some areas where our organizations compete, uh, we can't avoid that and going after proposals, uh, there, there's a, a lot of collaboration on this level also. Uh, so when we realized this year that we'd all be at the ICT for D conference together, and we'd all be at Net Hope. we decided to get together and talk about how we make decisions to create our models for our teams. And one thing we realized is there's no one right model. It really depends on your organization, uh, your projects, the, your spread globally. Uh, so, but, but there are certain decisions you have to make that uh, even within an organization, aren't always completely clear, but they, but they fall along a, uh, uh, a spectrum. So we're going to go through and answer some questions about how we made those decisions. Uh, and, and we're starting off with uh, where ICT for D, where, where our teams fall within our organizational structure. Uh, so, Alan, I'm going to ask you first to talk about uh, whether your team sits more at, on the IT side or more on the program side. Let me click ahead. <coughs> um, good. Thank you, John. So, in my uh, almost four years at Mercyport, we uh, probably like many of you tried many different of where to put uh, ICT for D, or T4D as we call it. Um, we've been 100% in programs, we've been 100% in the sectors, and now we find ourselves in a group called Strategy and People. And uh, we're in this group uh, because it's got strategy and we're trying to take a, a more futuristic, longer term view. Um, but also IT is in that same group. And the idea is that we creating unified technology strategy and vision for Mercy Corps. That extends from the impact that we expect to see in the field, all the way back into our internal data, infrastructure, and systems. So while we are separate teams today, uh, the strategy is going to bind us as one technology strategy ultimately. Great, thank you. And uh, Steve, how does CRS approach the same question? So I think you could 
make a very strong argument to put ICT 4D either in IT or in programs, and you could be successful with either model with one specific caveat. And that caveat is there has to be a strong bridge to the part of the organization you're not based in. So at CRS, we place this function within IT, so I report up to our CIO. My team is comprised mostly of folks who came up through tech roles. I do have a couple more um, program-oriented individuals. But the way we've been able to establish credibility with the program side of the organization is by embedding those individuals into programs to learn about the challenges and nature of the work such that they can talk fluently across both sides of the organization. So I think where the key is the partnership that's built between IT and between programs so that there is full transparency between both sides of the house, that there is joint responsibility, and most importantly, a shared vision for where you're trying to go with technology, with digital, and you're working in those things together, regardless of where you're placed within the organization. Okay, thanks, Steve. And then uh, another area of decisions we have to make is uh, where do we align our ICT for D teams? Are they um, are they set up more geographically so that generalists are based in regions and handle the ICT for D needs in that region? or are they more sector aligned? And uh, I can speak to this first. Uh, at at uh, Save the Children, we're more based on the sectors. Uh, we have people who are embedded in the sectors, who are experts and have been working in a while in, uh, in application of technology within their sector. And a lot of times they came up not through the IT team, uh, sometimes they have but uh, they, they more have been trained over time because they're running uh, projects that have significant ICT for D components within their sector, whether it's educational technology and health or what have you. Uh, and then Ahmed, uh, I'll ask you the same question. How do you align things at SOS? So in SOS, we are a bit on the opposite side, actually. The ICT 4D team, they are more uh, aligned by geography. So what we have is we have our global ICT 4D lead, that's uh, part of our program team in the headquarter. Then what we do have is we have various ICT 4D coordinators who are more or less on a program level. So it depends on the size of the ICT 4D project, some of our countries and member affiliates, they decide and say, okay, we need to get an ICT 4D project manager who will be managing the project. But a lot managing that project would be the responsibility of that person to start or always the process of developing new ICT 4D projects around the country. Great, thank you. Uh, the next scale that we'll go to is uh, the tool set that we choose in order to manage our programs. Um, and then Steve, I'm going to ask you first to talk about whether your tool set is more selected in the countries by the projects, or is it uh, something that's more centralized that comes from head offices? So we're clearly the outlier here. Uh, we air more towards uh, standard. So our standard toolbox includes um, uh, software for case management, mobile data collection, uh, cash and asset transfer reporting, and so forth. <coughs> We don't take a very authoritarian approach to enforce these standards, but rather we incentivize our program teams to choose things from our standard toolbox through a couple of mechanisms. In some cases, we centrally pay for the software, and so if it doesn't impact the program's budget, that becomes a very easy choice to make. In other cases, we put in place a framework agreement with a technology partner where we've already been through that technology trade-off process and uh, the competitive tendering process, and it makes it very easy for program team to tap into that tool and kind of frictionless in that, in that regard. So, so why do we do this? Uh, number one, predictability. Uh, by having a more standard set of tools, we can build depth of experience in those uh, applications so that our 
program managers can have a higher degree of confidence that their use of that tool will be successful. Uh, the second reason is efficiency, that we can have gain some cost savings through volume licensing, we can gain some efficiency by uh, investing in staff development in a more finite set of goals. And the third and maybe the most critical reason is around uh, information security. So our risk profile we feel is reduced by having a more finite tool set and frankly it's simpler and less complex portfolio. It allows us to be more intentional about how we're administering those systems and having the right management controls. I do want to acknowledge that there is a tension between things that are you know, standardized and more efficient or localized and maybe more effective. And so we're not fully off the chart on standards that we recognize that there is a place for to experimentation and trying out emerging technologies with a view towards those being the things that will be the next uh, platforms that will scale and come into our standard toolbox. Okay, thanks, Steve. And Scott, I, uh, you're also towards the standard size, but I know your organization has gone through a process in order to get there, so can you talk a little bit about that? So we, we have been on a journey, um, and we obviously, we don't want to step with the innovation. We really do believe that happens at the edges of the field, uh, to your point, functional solutions. Um, but uh, we want to learn how to dis you know, discover and harvest. Our goal is impact, to have the most impact that we possibly can. So we do want to go to scale. And that when we go beyond a national level or in within certain sectors, we have standardized on certain sectoral approaches and solutions. Um, and we've also gone to, we heard a little bit earlier from, from Compassion, we're going to a platform approach. So we have a platform for our waste reaction services, which is where most of our ICT for D resides. And we can simply take that idea that happens at the local level and then when we want to go to scale, we overlay digital identity, data integration, data privacy into the platform and can go to scale very quickly overnight. So our journey is to really go from getting the good ideas that are happening in the field, and if we want to scale that and have more impact, then we roll it into either a sector-based approach or an enterprise-wide approach that takes into account those things that you mentioned to, to make sure that we're addressing the scale, the data privacy, child protection things that we need to do. So. Great, thanks, and data privacy is uh, something that's on our minds a lot for all of our teams, so that's good to hear. Um, so the next decision we have to make is uh, how do we pay for these processes and, and these tools? Uh, Ahmed, how do you approach it at SOS? So the ICT4D budget in SOS, I mean, what we can say is we are having kind of a hybrid financing model, more or less. So our starting source of paying for ICT for the project is a global federation budget. So basically it's a budget that has been set aside to implement the federation strategy. So we use that budget actually to finance, let's say, the capital investments for the ICT for the projects. We start projects with that budget, we showcase, and then we move to the next phase, more or less of trying to scale up to try to reach more countries. So what we do is that we reach to both corporates as well as institutional donors. We reach to the corporates uh, not only on the level of just the technology component of the projects, but what we try to do is we try to encourage the corporate sector to finance the program activity in general. So if it's a youth employment process or if a youth employment project, sorry, then we don't come and we say just finance the tech component. We say no, we need to address the employability in general. And part of that is also is the technology and the corporate has been quite supportive. Then on the country level, the various countries that are applying for grants, uh, then what we do is that we also encourage them to integrate the technology cost as part of the, of the grants. So this is more or less like the hybrid financing that we are following in uh, SOS Children's Workers. Okay, great. And I can address this for Save the Children. We, uh, we get some unrestricted funds, but most of our projects or the technology components of our projects is paid through by project budgets. So again, uh, our, our, the people who focus on ICT4D are, are uh, embedded in their sectors and the budget also comes from the sectors. So as we're sitting down to plan a new project, whether it's in the business development phase or it's in the startup phase, we, uh, we make sure that the, uh, the budget for
for the technology associated with that project is included in the project budget. Um, so that uh, it gives us the opportunity just to make sure that, that we're really specialized on the needs of the project. Um, and if anything comes up that's uh, a, a, a special use of technology for that project, we're able to, to budget for it appropriately. Uh, and then the final axis is innovation risk tolerance. Uh, we all hear that it's, uh, it's good to fail and fail fast in Silicon Valley, but that's not always the case when you're managing a project and, and you're trying to make it succeed. Um, so Scott, I'll go to you first. Uh, how, how do you approach that? Well, obviously, we're, we're looking at the emerging technologies around blockchain, biometrics, how do we use those in our, in our fit-for-purpose context with an NGO. Um, you know, I would say, um, you know, it's, it's not about, it, you mentioned fail fast, we just say learn early, because there really isn't much tolerance in a grant or with restricted funding to fail. There isn't much tolerance when the life is at stake to fail. So we, we try to learn very fast and learn early, and then figure out how we can take those technologies to, to scale. Um, so we are skewing more towards um, uh, that platform approach, and so that's where we're looking at emerging technologies, how do we plug them into that platform where we've already taken care of some of it, again, around child protection, child safety. Uh, there is a role that we will always have to play in world vision between the child and the sponsor to make sure that, that child's safe, and that's where we want to make sure the emerging technologies are appropriate and still make them that safety level. Great. Thank you. And Alan, uh, how does Mercy Corps, uh, what, what would you say your risk tolerance is? Uh, we have a, a fairly high risk tolerance uh, for innovation. Um, let me tell you why. So, if you look at the Fortune 500 list from 1955 and compare it to today, <coughs> only 12% of the companies in 1955 exist today. Uh, estimates, economists are estimating that over the next 10 years, 50% of the S&P 500 companies are going to disappear, making way for new entrants, new products, new services, etc., etc. Now, when you contrast that with NGOs, uh, most NGOs were created in the early or mid 1900s. The big names of the NGOs then are primarily the big names of the NGOs of today. So the implication there is, are NGOs innovating, or are we being left behind? And when you contrast that also with the pace of greater new technology, emerging technologies, uh, we at Versicore don't believe that innovation is an option. In order to stay relevant, useful, and in the game, it's essential that we innovate. And so we have a, a fairly high risk tolerance for innovation. And if we have more than about 90 seconds, we can talk a lot about how you wrap that up in uh, ethical innovation as well. But uh, that's why we're there. Great, and we've done well. We uh, wanted to make sure we wouldn't go over over time, so we'd have some time for questions. Uh, Alan, do you want to just close out this part? Uh, yeah, um, first of all, I'm amazed we have time for your questions. <laughs> the, the rehearsal certainly didn't. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So the work that we're doing today uh, is more needed, I think, than ever before. There's 130 million people around the world in need of humanitarian assistance. 70 million, this includes 70 million, that have been forcibly moved from their homes due to climate and conflict uh, in their areas. This is a 50% increase in just the last five to six years. So that's, that's quite significant. Then when you think about uh, the technology that's being applied to that, I think it's just a drop in the ocean. In Africa, the median age of Africa is 19. So think about all those people who are 19 years of age looking for some kind of future, and what kind of future do they have against the backdrop of 4 IR, fourth industrial revolution, new technologies change and climate change and so on. In order to meet the demand of those future workers, the African nations have to create some 18 million jobs a year by 2035. 
um, climate change. Um, that's having such a major impact on weather patterns. It's causing weather to be unpredictable. Uh, severe weather coming in uh, with more frequency and intensity than ever before. It's changing the way food is produced. It's changing the way farmers work. And that's having a massive impact. So the work we're doing, I just wanted to say, uh, it's, it's more important today than it's ever been. On the opportunity side, we do have technology and innovation, and it's not going to solve everything, uh, but it's going to solve quite a bit. The concern I have around innovation and technology and innovation is we don't want to turn it into a gold rush mentality of pushing out technology because we think it's going to do some good, or being first to market if it's a new emerging market. Um, so we have to think about the ethics really carefully. And I think you guys have all seen the impact of weaponization of social media, uh, weaponization of information. Uh, we've got more data now than, than ever before, and it's increasing exponentially. We've been concerned in the past about uh, personally identifiable information, DII. We still are. But now we also have to be concerned with DII, or demographically identifiable information where you can triangulate data points and find out about a person's affiliation to a certain group. And when you know that, you can start pitching groups against each other, undermining trust, and that can lead to conflict and violence and so on. So as we go down this path of opportunity through technology and innovation, we need to really be conscious of this ethical piece as well. Um, the way I think we can perhaps tackle that is, uh, and capture this opportunity but mitigate against risk is uh, to, to think about more intentional collaborative innovation. Um, I think it came up with the previous speaker saying, you know, we have to work together more. And I think this is really, really true in innovation, where we can take the solutions that we know work and scale them. It doesn't matter who creates them, we could all use them. Uh, where we can accelerate learning faster by sharing the papers, sharing the learnings, sharing what we're up to. And events like this are a great place to start. But also so we can sit down in an innovation discussion and talk about the risk and use our collective brain power to mitigate that risk. So never before has there been an opportunity like this for us to make a difference, but never before, uh, I think, have the stakes been higher. So yes, we have to innovate, we have to innovate together, and we have to do it in a really clear, ethical uh, framework. Thank you, Alan, uh, and thanks everyone. So we have about seven minutes for questions, and uh, we'll take them from anyone in the audience. Hi, right, here, here. Hi, it's Neil from Oxfam. This has been an amazing presentation. Really enjoyed looking at the analysis that you had. Um, I was in a session yesterday, Dr. Christine Derry from MIT was talking about transformation processes of organizations in general and organizations like ours in particular. And she put together a graph, she may be here. She put together a graph which showed two pathways. One which was kind of on an efficiency, operational efficiency uh, pathway, like industrialization, I guess, of our work. And one was on an innovation pathway which was kind of changing the customer beneficiary experience and then seeking to scale that. And what I was thinking about when I was looking at this slide in particular was the correlation between those who have unrestricted versus restricted funding for the innovations and the risk tolerance. And I'd love for you to comment uh, perhaps on those, maybe one from each group who, who are on the, the high risk tolerance end of the spectrum and how much your funding is driving that appetite and capacity and maybe one from the other end of the risk tolerance spectrum and say how much is it being determined by um, the priorities of unrestricted funding and maybe uh, the you know project driven uh, initiatives and project driven incentives that are in place. So we're very fortunate you know, World Vision is a uh, we're faith based but we're also funded various ways. We have child sponsorship like Compassion which gives us some unrestricted funding. Uh, with grants funded um, and then campaigns around disaster management. So um, I would say, you know, to the MIT research, we're back basically on both journeys at the same time. Based on the portfolio, 
whether it's MarTech or um, you know business I, enterprise IT solutions, there's a digitization journey, an efficiency play there. And then on the programmatic side, what we call Ministry IT, our child sponsorship, our interventions around health or disaster management, we're on that innovation side of the journey. Um, and for us, um, I would say on the digital side, we focus a little bit more time on that child sponsorship experience, the beneficiary. So it's really about how do we decrease on our digital transformation journey, the distance, the time, the cultural barriers between the supporter, the funding agency, the child, the family, the community that we're trying to help. Um, so we're really trying to figure out on a digital transformation journey, how do we reduce that complexity, how do we increase the speed of the interaction between those two and have the impact both ways. Um, but that does, it, it is the child sponsorship focus that allows us to have the funding to do that. Um, and it, it really is a shift of focus. Um, one of our, our, what we think is a really good example of a success story so far is that focus is key for us. We want to shift the focus to the beneficiary, whether it's through innovation around digital beneficiary registration, or in our case, we, we recently changed the model, and we're going to be talking to Mike and Compassion tomorrow about how we extend this beyond World Vision. Um, we call it chosen, where the child chooses the sponsor. Completely shifts the focus. We've seen an, a six-fold increase in acquisition for children getting sponsored when you do that. If we can get to, to Jonathan's point around coalitions, if we can get compassion and save the LHL sponsorship organizations to help with, you know, shift that model, we can share our learnings. And that was four months from ideation to production. That goes from four million children at World Vision, two million for compassion, a six-fold increase, 30, 35 directly affected children now and their families. So that's where we're trying to focus our effort. But I think it is a, a dual journey. And one requires the unrestricted funding to be innovative. One is much more of an efficiency play around how are you more efficient, more effective. And there's not a lot of room in that from a funding perspective to ideate, unfortunately. That's really interesting. Uh, in Save the Children's case, I talked about how we're primarily funded through programs, which is restricted funding. Uh, but we've, we've had a large innovation initiative that reports directly to our CEO, Carolyn Miles, and uh, that's given innovation uh, uh, a lot of uh, coverage throughout the organization, and not just Save US, where I'm an employee, but across the whole Save the Children movement. Uh, we run uh, what's essentially a venture capital process, an internal VC process, where people from throughout the movement who have good ideas, who are on any level of the hierarchy, can apply and uh, send us a description of their idea. And if, uh, if a board of judges views it as strong enough, then uh, they can apply for funding. And uh, that, that's really the only unrestricted that goes into it. Uh, we have time for one more question. Good morning. Oh, well <laughs> Good morning, team. Great presentation. So, a question. Sorry, Gerald Waterfield, Save the Children International. A question for the panel. If you look at your portfolio of ICT for these solutions, where do they sit? Are they quick wins, manual chore, or are they big, you know, ambitious tools? And, and where do you think you have the most impact? Are you aiming that question up? All four of you. So, for us, it's not so much quick wins as the things that are going to replicate. That we, the things that have well, formalized into our tool set are those that we're able to use across many, many projects. So that's things like cash and asset transfer, that's a you know, general trajectory in the humanitarian sector, having the platforms to enable that type of program activity, um, mobile, offline case management type tools, the things that are used you know, dozens, hundreds of times. Um, so a little bit different take on the question, but 
It's not about quick wins, it's really about the impact, and when we go to impact, it gets scaled very quickly. Um, so one of the things that we've had to really deal with our IT people, we do put the program people and the IT people together, especially in the field. They're working side to side as they develop these solutions. They get hung up on the technology or the solution that they developed. And we've really said you need to be focused on the capability. So we're going to take your idea and your capability that you're, you're enabling whatever that intervention is, and we may redesign it from scratch because your idea we're interested in. But when we go to scale, we're going to probably change the technology, change the application. So we're really, that's what we kind of say is, rather than a quick win, are you trying to get your app or your solution so you don't have uh, a quick win? It's, does the capability, um, is it enabled by the technology? Is it having an impact? And then we'll worry about the scale. Okay, we have seven seconds left. Alan, you want the last word? Or Alan? <laughs> All right, um, real quick. Um, uh, quick wins versus long term uh, thinking. I think you need both. I think, you know, in the quick wins, there's a lot of iteration that can happen fast. That informs learning, that informs what you're going to do next. So we're doing some very small projects, very quick wins, but we're also working on innovation that's probably not going to have an impact for four, five, or six years. Uh, we think uh, having a I think the disadvantage of speaking the last is every answer is exhausted already. So everything that has been said more or less from our side, I would say on top of the quick wins on the long term is the question is how much does ICT for the products align to the strategic goals of the organization? That's that's for us what is really critical in this Okay, great. Well thanks for listening to us. Thank you, Matt Hope, for having us. long break. However, right in the middle of that break, we want to take the annual summit photo. So if by 10.55 you could find your way out near the lobby bar, we will all be gathered there for the photo and you don't want to miss out. Please be there. Thanks. Thank you.